evening um, and good afternoon. My name is Susanna Ellers. I'm from the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this stakeholder parallel session four on developing science diplomacy capacities, opportunities, networks through fellowship programs in the Americas. Um, so I am joined today by five fabulous fellows from across the Americas. We have Julian Campisi from Canada, Sebastian Riera from Argentina, Daniel Jimenez from Mexico, Asif Iqbal from Canada, and Cristina Fernandez Baca from the United States of America. And I am joined by Dr. Marga Wall Soler, world renowned science diplomacy expert, who will be moderating this session with me. So, just a brief overview of what we're going to be doing for the next 90 minutes is I'll share just sort of an introduction to the IAI and a little bit about our brand new science policy fellowship program that we just launched in 2020. And then I will turn it over to Marga to talk about the science diplomacy training modules that we've done in collaboration um, through the, the new program at IAI. And then we'll hear from each of the fellows. They're going to have about 10 minutes to present on their experiences, uh, which we're really looking forward to. So, And then we'll round out the session with 30 minutes of a question and answer. So please uh, put your questions in the chat as we go out, go throughout the session today. Um, but we're really looking forward to um, to seeing you all or hearing all your questions, not seeing you. Apologies. <laughs> so, OK, um, a little bit about the IAI. Uh, it's that it is uh, an Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research. It was established in 1992 as an intergovernmental treaty organization with 19 parties. So we work for 19 uh, governments in North and South America. And really the vision is to support scientists and decision makers to jointly address the critical issues associated with global change in the region. And the core values of the IAI are scientific excellence, international cooperation and full and open exchange of scientific information. And so really how we do this is through our science programs and our capacity building programs. And for the last 25 years, it's really been about promoting collaborative, well-informed decisions and actions at all levels. Um, and so everything we do is, is working across borders. It's at a regional focus, something tackling challenges that one country can't address on its own. So our latest initiative is the Science and Technology Policy Fellowship Program at STEP. We launched it in 2020, and it is based off of the AAAS Science Technology Policy Fellowship Program. It's very well known in the States. And it's really, um, we began developing it and designing it in 2019 and launched it in 2020. And before I talk a little bit more about that, I just want to say personally that um, I'm a scientist. <laughs> Trained, uh, trained in academia. My very first job was with the United States federal government, and I was just sort of thrown headfirst <laughs> into this new policy world. And my academic experience did not prepare me for this, the challenges and the the way that the policy world operates. And I would have loved to have had a fellowship program to have training and you know this networking opportunity. So it's really been. Um, really just a, a passion project for me to work with the IAI and develop the, the Science Technology Policy Fellowship Program with my colleagues here. So as I mentioned, it's based off the AAAS program, um, and we have really designed it with um, training in mind for leadership, communication, uh, science diplomacy, and to really build this network of an uh, inter-American network of science policy fellows. Our first cohort of fellows was launched in June 2020, and they are working at sort of, we call them our sustainable agricultural cohort, and they're working in Argentina in the private sector. And our second cohort was launched in at the end of August 2020, and it is a cohort working on sustainable cities, and they're placed at uh, various municipal agencies in the government of Mexico City. And so really it's, it's providing these early career researchers opportunities to uh, work outside academia and really get exposed to um, what it's like to make policies and decisions in the private and public sector. And it's not just about building human capacity in the Americas, but also institutional capacities as well. And so this is really the very first time we've had a program like this in, in uh, Latin America. So. Um, I guess that's probably enough out of me about the STEP program. Oh, but I did want to mention sort of, uh, it's not enough out of me. <laughs> One more thing. What sort of separates the IAI's uh, STEP fellowship program from some of our other more national focused programs like the AAAS program in the United States 
in the, the NITEX Canada Science Policy Fellowship Program is that while those programs are focused in, in individual countries, ours are, are across cross borders. And that's sort of everything that the IAI does because we're a regional organization that works for, for governments. Everything we do is cross borders. So really science diplomacy is at the heart of what IAI does. And so we saw an opportunity as our fellows are already working across borders to provide uh, science diplomacy training. So that's where Marga comes in, but we also were able to invite um, some fellows from AAAS and the MyTex Canada Science Policy Fellowship Program to really build this network um, and have training opportunities together. So I'm going to turn it over to Marga to tell us a little bit more about the science diplomacy training that we've been doing for the last, what, four or five months together. Thank you, Sana, everyone. Just checking if we need to show some slides or not, Sana, no, not at this point. Yeah, no, I'll start the slides after you, Marga. Just checking. <laughs> oh, okay, wonderful. Uh, so hi, everyone. I have the privilege to be involved in this wonderful program, um, this pioneer program of uh, science policy fellowships at the hemispheric level in the Americas. So just a little bit of uh, history and background. I, I began working with uh, the IAI in 2014, and I already, you know, immediately identified it was such a important instrument in the Americas and Latin America and the Caribbean in particular to uh, to play this instrumental role in science diplomacy because it was intergovernmental and all of the issues in its scientific agenda are dealing with transboundary uh, challenges. So global change includes everything, as you know, from climate change to water, uh, even global health. And so when uh, the opportunity came to, to um, to design a program for these fellows to, uh, to better learn about science diplomacy and get the skills, the networks, and, uh, uh, and the end, at the end of the day, the, the, the capacity to engage uh, with this, this multi-stakeholder ecosystem of science diplomacy, I didn't uh, hesitate to, to join in. So I am really, really excited to, uh, to join you today to introduce these uh, four representatives of each of the four fellowship programs at the national level from the US, from Canada, Argentina, and Mexico that come together um, through different tracks of professional development. And uh, one of them is science diplomacy. So what we do is for uh, about nine months or 10 months, um, we've had some introductory sessions on what is science diplomacy, what the history of science diplomacy is, what are the examples and main case studies in the region. As we know, science diplomacy has been, the discourse has been dominated by the global north for many years. So trying to contextualize the examples and the case studies to the region, um, and then to uh, develop some uh, cross-boundary partnerships between them. So. Um, we split them into four groups. Each group has one science diplomacy challenge to address, and each of the group is uh, composed by one fellow from each country. So they represent uh, four different countries, they represent different disciplines, different backgrounds, and they are placed at different policy institutions for their fellowship. So it is a you know, fantastic, magnificent experiment uh, to, to really try to bring all of these perspectives together, national, um, disciplinary, cultural, and also, uh, you know, we were talking about multi-level science diplomacy. Uh, we've talked a lot about this in the conference to really bring not just the federal level uh, and the foreign ministries, but also in Mexico, we have the city level or the state level. And in Argentina, uh, there's a strong involvement of the private sector. So it really uh, reflects this um, ecosystem of science diplomacy that is not just limited to the national federal um, government. So with that, I think I will turn it to the fellows because we're eager to hear from them about their experience so far and about the projects that they have um they they are um envisioning for for this year um so please uh, make sure to put your questions in the q a box and any comments or general information sharing in the in the chat so back to you susanna okay hi just a reminder for those of you joining late, this is the session on developing science diplomacy capacities, opportunities, and networks for future science policy leaders through fellowship programs in the Americas. And before I turn it over to Julian, I just wanted to share with you all um, 
the picture of the 19 fellows that are participating in Marga's science diplomacy training modules where we've brought them together and broken them into the four groups. So these are our wonderful fellows. And now Julian, I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Susanna. Hi, everyone. And good afternoon. Uh, my name is Julian Campisi, as Susanna just mentioned. I'm one of the Canadian Science Policy Fellows uh, through the MyTax program. Um, I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes just talking a bit about, you know, my own background, how I came into this program, and then the STEP program. Um, talk a bit about our our colleagues from from the other programs in terms of our group projects through the science diplomacy modules, and then spend a few minutes actually. Uh, going into some of the details of our um, particular project, which I'll explain the context about in a moment. So just a bit about me. Um, uh, as you can see here, I, uh, I have a PhD from York U in Toronto in political science. Um, before that, before getting into academia, I had always been quite interested in research expeditions, of course, travel. I participated in a number of academic exchanges to Europe and Asia Pacific. Um, after that, I had the opportunity to work in Sydney for in the private sector for about a year for an insurance firm um, <clears throat> in 2008 or nine. Following that, I returned to Canada, but to Vancouver to pursue a master's degree in interdisciplinary European studies, which was very interesting. Um, following that two year program, I, uh, I moved to China uh, to work for about two years, um, which was, uh, again, a wonderful experience. And I met a lot of different people from, from many different backgrounds. Um, but I still wanted um, to pursue more study, let's say. So I applied for a PhD program in Toronto and thankfully got into a political science program. And for the years between 2013 and 2018, I, uh, I pursued a PhD in comparative politics, uh, political economy, and eventually uh, focused my dissertation research on political risk analysis in developed economies. So this is more or less, you know, what are the socio and political factors that affect foreign direct investment? What are investment determinants, et cetera? And luckily, I was able to conduct quite a bit of um, qualitative field work across the EU, um, at which time I was a visiting scholar at Luis Guido Carli uh, University in Rome, and this was in 2015 and 2016. I defended in uh, the very end of 2018 and then graduated in 2019. And since then, for about a year and a half, I had been working at the University of Toronto, teaching public policy, um, Canadian politics, and international relations until 2020, mid to end 2020 during the pandemic, where um, before that I had applied for um, a, the MyTax program, which I'll explain in a moment. Um, a side note, I had always been obviously interested in the policy world, being a political science student for many, many years. And I always looked at these different types of policy fellowships that were available as something, you know, as someone who studied government for a long time, but never had a chance to work other than a summer job in a specific policy field. I was always curious about what that is. Um, obviously, it's a potential new career path. There are different challenges and opportunities that come with this. Um, and of course, different types of analysis of policy, rather than studying it, you're actually on the perhaps the making policy side. Um, so that is where I found this uh, MyTax uh, Canadian Science Policy Fellowship. Um, and I was placed with the Department of National Defense in Canada, of course, and it's a specific or a unit called DRDC, which is Defense Research and Development Canada. And my specific team works on science policy integration. And so we work with a lot of um, in, intra-departmental, but also interdepartmental across the federal family and providing research and analysis, et cetera, on a number of different security and defense related issues. Next slide, please. So just for a moment, I'll speak about the, um, the MyTax Fellowship Program in Canada. Um, so MyTax is obviously the organization that, that runs this program and it's a nonprofit uh, research organization that partners with Canadian academia, private industry, government, um, and it operates a number of different research and training programs in fields related to industrial and social innovation. They provide uh, different types of fellowships, internships, training opportunities, research collaborations, um, exchanges, 
and in many cases can place students, postdocs, et cetera, with different professors at universities, but also at different companies um, with faculty and you know, private firm sponsors. Um, so this means depending on the fellowship, you may have you know, a postdoctoral salary where you're working both for a private company and the university and sort of splitting your time between them to get you into the world of industry or government or what have you while sort of keeping um, a one foot in academia, if you will. And so one program they offer, um, I guess, in similar vein to the AAAS Science and Tech Fellowship is it's comparatively new. I think it's only a few years old, four years or so, the Canadian Science Policy Fellowship to sort of place postdocs um, in government departments to help solve public policy challenges. Right. And so PhD holders from any discipline are have a 12 month immersion into the policy making process with participating government departments. Um, I believe there are approximately 20 or so placements per year that are, you know, vetted, of course, and matched with departments um, at the subnational and federal level. So it could be provincial, but I believe it's mostly placed in federal government departments. Um, there's obviously ongoing training, professional development seminars, uh, networking opportunities, unfortunately this year virtual only, um, but hopefully back in person sooner rather than later. And of course, different um, networking and job opportunity events. Some fellows stay in government if offered you know, further contracts, others return to academia or elsewhere. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, my placement was with uh, the National Defense. Others are of my cohort are with um, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, others with Health Canada, National Research Council and departments like that. Next slide, please. So with this fellowship program as, uh, as Susanna was, was mentioning earlier, we are we're given the opportunities um, to learn and network um, with other fellowship programs. So not only can we learn about science policy in our own national programs or, or whatever the specifics may be, which is you know where I learned about science diplomacy more specifically, and of course was immediately intrigued um, in the field that I didn't know really much about. Um, and so we had a few professional development sessions on the MITAC side with, uh, with our cohort, um, and one of, which, one of which was the science diplomacy session. And I knew it was a field that I wanted to learn more about. And that's where I had the, where I learned about the AI STEP program opportunity uh, that Marga told us about. Um, and what I thought was really appealing about, you know, both our own science fellowship and the STEP program was, you know, the possibility to learn more about how different government departments um, approach policymaking and how they incorporate science into decision making and also to learn about how the fellows in different countries through their programs approach that type of work in their own fields. Um, other benefits, of course, are, you know, different social interactions, getting to know people from all these different places and their own fellowship programs, learning a bit about best practices, um, networking again, uh, participating in conferences such as this one, and of course, different training on new concepts, methods like science diplomacy. Um, and as someone who always thought that they would have been a better diplomat than scientist, um, I thought that this combined field uh, could make a lot of sense for me to learn a bit more about. So that's uh, what I've been trying to learn more uh, the past couple of months through the STEP program, which has been uh, really great. Next slide. Um, so one of the great things about the the step program and the science diplomacy modules is the ability to work of course with new people on new projects and so um you know we got into groups with fellows from other programs um and here in this slide you can sort of see the di diverse backgrounds of the team or, or of the group that we put together so basically a few months ago we were tasked with coming up with different potential topics of interest that could be under the umbrella of science diplomacy or you know issues that needed to be tackled from that perspective and then we ranked our favorite topics and eventually we were placed in these groups with other fellows um, so our group topic, which I'll speak to in the next slide, is on the climate fragile polar regions. And as you can see here, we're made up um, of fellows from Canada, the US, Mexico, and Argentina, with, of course, different sets of expertise. Um, we have an anthropologist who who's dealt with Arctic science and climate change. She's also placed, Julianne, uh, with me at DRDC Canada. Um, myself, political scientist and political economist, um, we have 
cell and developmental biology specialist placed with the National Science Foundation in the US, um, a geographer in the Secretariat on, um, on uh, science and tech in Mexico, and of course, a biological scientist in conservation uh, placed in Argentina in an agrosystems field. Next slide. And very briefly, this last slide um, just talks about how sort of, you know, our different backgrounds and sets of expertise, I think really allowed us to approach the topic or the problem of, um, you know, science and diplomacy in the, in the polar regions by bringing together different perspectives and geographic locations that, that I just explained to sort of use science diplomacy to move forward on what we think is a very pressing issue. So obviously climate change is has been for some time warming the polar regions and the globe at an unprecedented rate. And you know this has implications for a number of global issues, um, both scientific and diplomatic issues, and of course combined. So things like navigation and transportation, um, security and sovereignty, um, indigenous peoples, marine conservation, you know, melt and rising oceans, et cetera, et cetera. I could go on. Um, and so the issue that we wanted to tackle. And I really stress that, I mean, not only for our group, but probably for most of the other groups you're about to hear from is this is the very first stage of our project. And so we're just really bringing together different ideas and finding how we're going to sort of attack these ideas. And so what we came up with um, is more or less around this idea of strengthening the Arctic Council, um, putting forward ideas towards a proposal on more cooperative science based activities in the Arctic, but using best practices from Antarctica. And so we want to consider both how diplomatic relations can advance science and how science of a changing polar region can inform diplomatic relations. And to that end, we are looking at solutions to more cooperation on things like security and navigation in the polar regions, um, science-based activities, looking at things like the UN laws of the sea and sea ice forecasts, discussing geopolitical implications, defense and security, and of course, natural resource extraction and conservation. Um, so using best practices from science cooperation in places like the Antarctic, such as the Antarctic Treaty, and how countries can come together to make sure the Arctic is you know, not, let's say, abused in a natural resources or transportation or geopolitical manner um, in the coming decades. So I'll leave it at there and look forward to some questions later and pass it on to the next fellow. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much, Julian, for the introduction. Good morning, afternoon, or good evening, whoever, wherever you're located. My name is Sebastian Riera. It's a pleasure to join the session. I hope you can hear me well. Otherwise, Susana, please let me know. Well, um, my group, my subgroup, the group two is composed by, I think it's like seven fellows, and we divided into a subgroup, which I'm accompanied with these two fantastic professionals, Ali Villarreal and Zach Valdez. We are focusing on the circular economy, and we decided to work on different aspects in the Latin America. But before going so, I forgot to introduce a slide about a self-introduction, so this will be very, very brief. Uh, as you know, my name is Sebastian. I'm from Mendoza, Argentina that's Central West, I'm a former economist linked with the use of or trying to apply empirics evidence into the agricultural sector. So I did my master in uh, agribusiness and rural development economics. That was a joint program in the Universidad de Talca and in the University of Göttingen in Germany, where later I did my PhD program in agricultural economics, but I went from Agicon more in detail into the use of uh, water resources in agriculture. So I'm very interested into the connections, into the connections of water, the, the evaluation of the resource and so on. And that led me to a postdoc uh, that is jointly financed by Conicet and CREA, which is a great opportunity to be, to actually practice science diplomacy. And why I say it so, because CREA is a, is a private organization of agricultural producers, very technified agricultural producers. And the concept is the public institution for research, is the public council for research and, and applied um, investigation. So this uh, role as a postdoctoral uh, endowed with the science diplomacy course 
provides a lot of tools for actually bridging, bridging the gap between science and policy and empirical applications. So that brief introduction, and we'll go to the next slide and I will talk, why are we focusing on circular economy? Basically, because we want to move from the linear to circular, um, circular thinking, that means uh, we are trying to say is that we want to change the approach of replacing the end of life of products into a restoration, uh, providing a shift into the energy systems and rethinking waste. Then next point will be, let's, what are the principles of circular economy? Basically, design out the waste and pollution, keep materials and product in, in use, and later stimulate, of course, business and new job opportunities. That idea of having everything circular means not only producing to have a, a product that will finish in the disposal, but rather produce what is going to be needed with the excep exceptional materials that allow for natural resource recomposition. Please, next slide. So a brief, very brief um, introduction into Latin America and what is happening from today into two, uh, 2050, basically from Mexico to the southest point in Ushuaia, Argentina, there are three, 644 million inhabitants and that number will increase to almost 720 million inhabitants. And there will be more concentration in the cities. Nowadays, quite concentrated 80%. And that's going to be five, four percent more to 44, 40, sorry, 84 percent in cities. And on average, according to some statistics, we have that each person, the per capita consumption of, uh, of plastic daily goes between half kilograms and 1.5 kilograms per person. That could be translated into one million plastic bottles per minute in the region. Is astronomic the amount of uh, plastic that is being produced and disposed. These are not only the, um, this will lead to one of the two topics that we decide to engage into our project. So please, next slide. One of the topics is regarding the plastic use in Mexico City. And for those that are in the region, it might be quite aware that Mexico City imposed a legislation, they acknowledge in this issue of tons of plastics being disposed every day. They impose a restriction of using plastic bags. That's the current picture take, uh, taken from a compost plant in Mexico City. And that shows a lot of plastic being wasted every single day. Next slide, please. This uh, banning of single plastic use was introduced this year. And while many countries have a, applied similar legislation, this concentration of Mexico City makes this an, a very exceptional case to treat it. Because as talked with our colleagues, this, the concentration and the tremendous size of the city brings additional interest of how can not only a legislation taking place, how can we enforce or make sure with evidence-based results to change a little bit of the culture in order to use plastic with more consciousness. Uh, we can go into the next slide and I'll go step by step with some of the statistics of the usage of plastic in Mexico. So this is a, a common value that everybody will know that what reusable bags avoid six plastic bags. And then we have an amount of uh, plastic bags of an average that have been, it's been used in Mexico City according to some statistics. But unfortunately, from all that plastic, less than 1% has been recycled and the pulse consumption is even lower. So there's a huge room for improvement here. We think that the consideration of Mexico City and the use of plastic and taking advantage of the current legislation that it's based on, uh, on evidence, we can derive in some in policy implications or some suggestions following some cases or successful cases of implementation uh, of different, uh, different countries within our culture. Um, that's a short introduction of the topic. We'll go to the second topic that we're gonna be treating in the group. And that's related, of course, 
with water. And in particular, not with water for consumption directly, but we're talking about wastewater. This is quite important in the region because among all, Latin America is one of the greatest sources of fresh water. And while the area itself changes on ecosystems from very salvatic to very arid and extreme, extreme arid regions, the need for water varies along the continent and the use of water, it needs to be enforced. But it's only for the fresh water utilization needed? No at all. Wastewater needs to be enacted. We need more legislations and we need more diplomacy in order to make the wastewater to change the consciousness about how to use it. At the current stage, only 66% of the population is connected to sewage. And that, that percentage of that share is increasing in the urban areas. It's not 99%, but on average, it's 77%. So that means in rural areas, that's below 20%. And about all this source of water, this massive volume of water, on average, between 30 and 40% is treated. But countries as Argentina, Bolivia, Colombia, Panama, that share is below 20%. Whereas when we look at our countries with some clear policies with respect to this, like Chile, Mexico, Peru, and Uruguay, their treatment goes above 40%. Next slide, please. And valuing the resource from different alternatives have been in the focus for many institutions. That's how the World Bank, pretty much in, in a report that was issued the last two years, they focus on saying, okay, we need to consider water, not as a waste, but rather as a resource itself. There are several examples worldwide that can be a, emulated, applied, or indirectly analyzed how we can use this in Latin America in order to make water or wastewater reutilized for agricultural or industries application, produce energy that uh, will provide several revenues and savings, while also utilizing some of the outputs or byproducts as a nutrients or fertilizers in biosolid conditions. So the, the gloves here means like, let's get our hands on into wastewater treatment and consider that as a resource. And how are we gonna do this with two different areas but not, ex, not intimately related? We'll, we, I'll show you the, in the next slide, how are we thinking to approach these problems? Then circular economy will be considered with the participation of five main areas. Uh, next slide, please. There we go. We felt uh, first we'll have a vision on how we're gonna engage this. Uh, where we have defined more or less the location that we want to focus on it. Make sure that incentives need to be not only monetized, but also the awareness of, of climate change, the awareness of environmental effects of our current lifestyles. Next slide, please. And of course, regulation that will provide debate. Legislation is above all one of the greatest issues. Already one minute? Okay, let's go, let's go one, <laughs> one more slide. Sorry, I thought it will, I was going to be shorter. So basically, we have uh, two main topics, single plastic use and wastewater potential. And the location, that's going to be Mexico City and successful cases. The wastewater potential will be assessed in Latin America treatment plan, basically focusing on urban, peri-urban uh, conglomerates. And we're thinking about, as an output, provide assess assessment tools or circularity to, so to provide an idea or give, give Mexico City an idea of how can I assess myself if my economy is approaching to a circular perspective or not, that will be with the scorecard indicators or establishing some guidelines. And on the other hand, wastewater potential will provide an idea of technological gap assessment. Either or, or both together, we aim at providing a position report, or it could be a co-edited paper to sustain our participation on how can science diplomacy enact or faster the process towards these resources. And that's 
it for me now. And thank you very much for your attention. I will open to questions. Thank you, Sebastian. I see if you're up. Yeah. Can you hear me? OK, awesome. So thanks, Susanna and Marga, for the introduction. And thanks to IAI for providing us this opportunity to share our experience today. Uh, to save some time, I'm not going to talk a lot about my host program, as Julian already delivered a nice outlook of my text program. But I just want to touch down uh, on the fact that, similar to Julian, I'm also a MyTex Canada Science Policy Fellow. And to be precise, Julian and I are part of the current cohort of this amazing program. So in my case, I have been assigned to Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada to work on multiple policies and decisions currently underway or happening inside our government. Next slide, please. Okay. Awesome. So in regard to our II project, I have partnered with Vicente Morales and Nikia McDonald, and we are having a uh, very beginning, uh, we're, we're at, uh, at the beginning stage of our project, which is based on clean energy. Uh, this is very st early stage of our project, but I can tell you that we are very much excited to work together and contribute to this project. So far, we are uh, we have been involved in discussions uh, regarding what could be uh, you know our project topic, and uh, we actually streamlined some of those uh, very exciting ideas that we actually uh, uh, came up. And at the same time, we are receiving trainings on science and diplomacy from IAI and from our host organizations, which is great. So this kind of training is very important for all of us, as as this provides very clear answers to the questions like why scientists and researchers should be involved in policymaking and diplomacy, or how scientists like ourselves can efficiently contribute not only to the science, but also to the policy front in order to fight the existing global challenges. Now, before diving into our project, I would like to briefly introduce members of our team. As we can all see here, like we have backgrounds in science and research. Uh, so the first member of our team is Vicente, who has background in physics and now providing science advice to streamline sustainability strategy for Mexico City. We also have Nikia, who has background in fuel cell research, and she is very passionate about clean energy and currently working at the US Department of Energy. And finally, I am Asif and currently working as a policy analyst at the Innovation and Growth Policy Division at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. And I also have background working on solar fuel and data-driven technology. So the next slide, please. Okay. In the course of my brief experience in policy front, I have this very exciting realization that science and policy combined together offers an intriguing intersection. So I can see that uh, every day in my work and I have learned a lot from my colleagues at AFC on how they are making these big policies and providing meaningful impact, not only to the individuals, but also to our nation. And seeing that, uh, that I can also add value to our amazing team and can use my experience, um, which is based on research and science, make me realize that science and policy intersection is certainly a great platform to deliver impactful and meaningful uh, uh, work. Next slide, please. So now moving on to our project. So our focus is clean energy. The question is why? So we all know that ensuring clean energy is the long standing challenge that we have to solve to fight climate change. So when we see the raging wildfire in Australia or in the United States, we know that how bad the climate change could be. When we see the residents of island nations like Kiribati uh, forced to move from their island, and because of this rising sea level, we immediately realize this nightmare is actually happening. And our dependency on fossil fuel is a key contributor to the climate change. And we really need to act right now to solve this enormous challenge. Now, the good news is we have so many great minds and so many policies coming together to solve this clean energy challenge. Next slide, please. 
So in terms of developing policies and streamlining our, our strategies, there are so many um, leaders, policymakers right now actively working on uh, this topic, starting from global scales, for, for example, like the UN to large and small countries and to local uh, municipalities or cities. So at the same time, there are so many players and organizations they would love to contribute and learn from these activities. For example, maybe there's a state or city that wants to know the best practice for adopting green technologies or renewable energy policies, but not entirely sure where to start. And there are also, uh, since there's so many best practices that can be followed, but the question is, is there any single place where you can go and learn about these policies and developments? Next slide, please. So again, in terms of science and technology, there are so many research activities, uh, for example, happening at national to international collaborations and this kind of scales. Um, uh, a lot of these technologies that are being developed in research lab or in private companies are very exciting, but maybe right now at a very early stage uh, of their development cycle. So however, policymakers also need to know this technology that, are, that has reached to a higher readiness level to get a sense of how we can accomplish these clean energy goals. Also our universities, researchers, um, um, they need to know like what is the policy landscape look like or how they're evolving so that they can align their research uh, according to this policy landscape and get funded and they can work towards this, to accomplishing this goal. So all in all, we need one place where we can all go to and connect all these dots. And that's why our project comes in. Uh, next slide, please. So we realized in our brainstorming session that it would be really helpful if we have a go-to place to learn about this evolving policy landscape on clean energy. So we'll start small for now. So our goal is to start uh, uh, you know, like includes all the policy that we have in North America and have a long term vision to go to global. So to give more details, like our goal is to build a repository for North America, where our team members will collect information on key policies and research activities happening in our countries and we'll store this information in our digital repository. So when you come in, you can see what's happening in terms of clean energy in North America, just in, uh, just at one go. So if you would like to know what's the low carbon fuel standards in British Columbia or in, or in California, you can, you can check it here. Or if you want to know how Mexico City uh, pursuing its solar city concept, you can also find it here. Uh, you can also come and check how did Toronto build the largest fleet of electric uh, buses in North America. Next slide, please. So um, as I say, like we'll start small and only to focus on what's happening in North America, but our vision is to go global. So we intend to pass this on to the future IAI cohorts working on clean energy projects. So we hope they will be building on to it. And also our hope that other collaborators will also chime in and share, their, share, share what's happening in their respective countries or jurisdiction and add those to our repository. And that's why we're calling this a living repository that will keep on going and adding more and more countries, states or municipalities. That way we'll be able to capture the evolution of clean energy landscape and, and in a much uh, ambitious uh, timeline, for example, 2030 or 2050 and beyond, we'll be able to see how mankind's combined science, technology and policy efforts together and help fighting climate change. And this will be a great learning experience for all of us. So uh, to summarize, this is a very small effort compared to what we are fighting against at this point. But we hope that uh, we can at least assist uh, the policymakers, leaders, or researchers uh, in a small possible way. Uh, if one leader, one country, or one city have, um, you know, like find it uh, helpful, um, so then we know like we have actually accomplished something. So with that, I would like to stop here and uh, looking forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Asif. Sorry about my, my bad management of the slides. <laughs> Daniel, your, 
you're up. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much to all of you who are watching this, coming to see us. So, <clears throat> good morning, good evening. So, my name is Daniel Jimenez, and I am from the group four, which, uh, again, I, I thank Julian. I think he made a very fine introduction to all this project. So, we are group four which deals with sharing data at the global health and global change nexus. So all of four of us who are working on this team, as you can see, is Shreda Kanapati from MyTex in Canada, Alice Grossman from AAS in the USA, Monica Jimenez from Secte in Mexico, and myself from Secte in Mexico also. Next slide, please. So, uh, well, uh, I would like to talk briefly about how I got here, how like the rest of us uh, came into this program. And as you can see by now, we all have uh, different backgrounds, but in the end, we, we, not, we end up in this kind of uh, science diplomacy training, uh, which is a, a very uh, fantastic journey, I, I should say. So. My early interest was in science, astronomy to begin with, but then I switched, well, so to speak, to physics. That was my university major. So then I went to uh, master in physics, which dealt with uh, mathematical physics, but all the time I was looking for a broader outreach. So I was, I wanted, uh, that physics could go through some more topics. So with, with say like a more societal outreach. So finally I had the chance to work, to apply for a transdisciplinary PhD. So that allowed me to mix, so to speak, physics with some other topics, some other areas. So that for me, that was uh, my, my thesis was on the statistical analysis of financial time series. Uh, so then, uh, we have uh, an opportunity with uh, with a program uh, for the Ministry of Education of the of Mexico City, which that that was that allowed us a lot of us to work on this uh, project. That. It was very interesting because that led us to different ministries where we could work on trying to do some kind of scientific advice, but also science diplomacy. So in my case, uh, my first year was on the Mexico City subway system. And then uh, I moved to the uh, mobility ministry, which is both of them, as you can see, uh, this was deals with transportation. And currently now we are working with the AI and uh, well, it's, it's a science in a broader context that which that which was what I was looking for. So next slide, please. So uh, uh, when we think about our topic, which is uh, the data sharing, we can think about this uh, underlying topic, which is already present. Now, maybe a little out of focus because of the COVID, but this is something that is going to affect us all the world for a lot of years. So we were thinking about the, how the infectious diseases are going to change, so to speak, uh, with this uh, climate change uh, issue. So in this, uh, in this image, you can see how the infectious disease, the main infectious diseases have been behaving from 1920 to the present. So you can see that, for example, smallpox is zero in the 1980s because so many um, things involved. But you can see that some others like HIV, tuberculosis and malaria are uh, very prevalent diseases. So these diseases need to be addressed because uh, they affect a lot of uh, regions all over the world. As you can see 
in the next slide, please. This is a, a, an image. This, this kind of image is, is very familiar to all of us by now, maybe. So you can see how the trends, the temperature trends are, are behaving. And you can see that the, the, great, the greatest uh, changes in temperature are mainly across uh, Europe, Northern Europe, well, mostly Europe, Northern America, South America. So all of this is only to show you that these uh, temperature changes are coming where there are a lot of people moving uh, and living. So you can see that as the temperatures grow, this is going to affect not only some coastal lines or whatever, but some other things. As you can see in the next slide, please. Here we can see the, the resolution is not very good. I, I don't mean that. But you can see this is from a scientific paper from 2000, 2005. And this table shows how the health impacts are going to be or are thought to be in the different continents. So I highlighted in yellow. What you can see is we could say that uh, a common um, impact that is going to be present in all the, con all the continents. So you can see the vector borne diseases are expected to, to change, to grow, or to be a pending menace in all the continents. So when dealing with the, with the diseases, we we have to think about this uh, vector bond diseases and that how this is going to affect for all the continents. So next slide, please. Uh, we have to think about this. We have to, to think about of all the things that are, that are going to change uh, when climate change comes is how is, how, how can we tackle this? So we are interested in thinking about data sharing in the light of the, this agent, this vector born diseases, and these agents, how are going to be moving? So how can science, how science diplomacy can help to deal with this? Next, next slide, please. So, well, we think about the data sharing. We think about how these uh, health experts are going to uh, need to share the data about how to mitigate the, these effects of climate change on these vector-borne diseases. And we are thinking about hosting an international expert panel to discuss these challenges, all these challenges and these possible strategies for solutions. So the final outcome we expect will be, will be a white paper on some key recommendations on some different topics. We know that there are a lot of uh, layers, a lot of things to be discussed when thinking about data sharing, when thinking about uh, uh, health, and when thinking about this, this mobility across nations. So in here we listed some of the topics that we thought about um, discussing. For example, the assessment of underlying causes of disease. This is a very important topic because we need to think not only the data, not only uh, the raw material, but also about the social implications of this. So we would like to think about these underlying causes. The data sharing, the interoperability needs that are going to be present. Also the best practices we need to, to have present for the data sharing. The resource allocation there also needs to be thought of especially when dealing with uh, these across nation movements, movements, the programmatic prioritization we need to have. And of course, some other very important topics, which are, for example, the privacy, transparency, and public trust, because this is a very important topic we need to think about when uh, dealing with health data, personal data. And of course, the national security consideration, which is also a very important topic that we need to think about when thinking about how these different uh, nations are going to be working on. And of course, they need also to protect their, their own 
their own personal personal uh, national security considerations that need to be uh, think of. So uh, next slide, please. That's it for me. And thank you for your attention. And here is our contact. So thank you all. Thank you, Daniel. 10 minutes exactly. And for our final presentation, we have uh, Christina. Last but not least. <laughs> Hello. Um, so I'm presenting on behalf of my group, the Sustainable Agriculture and the Food, Water, Energy Nexus. Next slide, please. So my background, uh, I grew up growing, uh, going to Peru in the summers, and I think that really created an awareness of international relations, which isn't necessarily common to uh, US citizens. It also drove an interest in water quality and environmental issues. In the top picture, you see my family and I at my grandmother's farm, and below that, you see me and my grandmother at a marina. Um, so we really spent a lot of time outdoors. We were eating lots of food, and we were getting sick quite often. Um, the water quality isn't great in Peru in a lot of locations. Um, Sebastian talked a little bit about a wastewater treatment. So lack of wastewater treatment can really impact water quality and drinking water quality as well. Um, so that kind of really drove my interest in environmental engineering. So I pursued a PhD at Cornell University where I studied wastewater treatment systems. Um, and I also did a project on water quality monitoring in New York State recreational beaches. So you can see one of our beach sites down at the bottom um, where people go swimming. So we monitored for fecal indicator bacteria and things like that to make sure water was safe for people to be swimming in. Um, I then wanted to move to kind of a more government position, more applied science. So I did a postdoc at the US Department of Agriculture where we were studying arsenic accumulation in rice. Um, but going through kind of this very academic research track, I realized that I wanted to kind of expand my skill set and my knowledge base and move into uh, a field that was more applied. Um, so next slide, please. That is when I decided to pursue the AAAS uh, Science and Technology Policy Fellowship. So their mission is to connect science with policy and foster a network of science and engineering leaders who understand government and policymaking. So it's a pretty well established fellowship. They started in 1973 with just seven fellows that served in congressional offices. And they were able to provide their scientific expertise to these people in uh, these decision makers um, and policymakers. Next slide, please. AAAS has grown quite a bit. Um, it's a really popular fellowship for people that want to move kind of away from the research arena and the academic setting to uh, a more uh, government or policymaking uh, side of things. So it places about 250 fellows each year across all branches of the federal government. It's no longer just in congressional offices, there's executive branch and judicial branch. Um, fellows are from a broad range of backgrounds. You can see uh, a picture of our 2020-2021 cohort uh, below. So we're all remote right now, unfortunately, but um, you can see we're we're all taking selfies there. So normally the picture would be taken in front of the Capitol, but that was not possible this year. Um, and my fellowship, I was placed with the Department of State in the Office of Mexican Affairs. Um, this kind of stems from my interest in addressing trans transboundary issues and um, kind of working in that international piece with my, uh, hopefully applying my scientific knowledge. And through AAAS, we have a lot of professional development courses um, that we take and kind of learn to use our skills and knowledge in a new area. Next slide, please. So on top of this AAAS fellowship, uh, I learned about the STEP fellowship and I wanted to join because um, I'm really interested in that piece of science diplomacy and then building those international connections with other researchers, particularly in fields that I'm interested in, so environmental issues and water issues. Uh, so far, my experience has been great. We've had uh, a couple of training uh, modules so far, and we've been learning about science diplomacy through just real life examples. Um, and we've also been seeing it 
the science-based policy, which is a huge piece of AAAS, of course, but in an international setting, which we don't really get with the AAAS fellowship as much. So it's, for me, adding kind of another layer to my training um, that I wouldn't have uh, exposure to otherwise. And what's interesting about it is AAAS, a lot of the SCPF fellowships are kind of at the national level. So we are only considering kind of stakeholders in our own country. Whereas with the STEP fellowship, we're really um, bringing into account the different goals and priorities of different countries and their stakeholders. The most recent module we have broken up into groups to um, kind of tackle different projects. And somebody uh, said this, I can't remember their name in, in the conference earlier on Monday, they said science collaboration leads to uh, science diplomacy. And I've been really kind of uh, feeling that statement is true as we work through our projects um, going forward. Next slide, please. So our group uh, is composed of three fellows. Two of us are AAAS fellows. Jennifer Chisholm and I are with the SCPF program. And then uh, we have a CREA fellow, uh, Matias Goldenberg, who is from Argentina. Next slide, please. So just a brief background on my fellow fellows. Jennifer Chisholm has a PhD in sociology and she is also at the Department of State and she is in the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor. She said she joined STEP for the chance to network with other researchers interested in science diplomacy. Next slide. Our CREA fellow is Matthias Goldenberg. He has a PhD in agricultural sciences. Uh, he's a postdoctoral researcher co-funded by CONICET in CREA. And he joined STEP to apply some of the experiences in science diplomacy to interact with farmers and decision makers in his region. He also said about the STEP fellowship, I have gained a lot of interactions with researchers around the world. Next slide, please. So you can see that all of us are kind of really interested in making these international connections and we're interested in science diplomacy and tackling different issues. Um, so far, our group is still kind of in the process of defining a project we are kind of tossing around different ideas. Um, two of the ones that we've talked about most recently are what motivates countries to fund international research. So um, why is country A funding research in country B? What are their interests there? Another project idea we've been thinking about is doing a comparative analysis of how different countries tackle the same issue, be it water, agricultural, or energy. How is country A doing it? How is country B doing it? Is country C doing anything at all? Um, so, so kind of looking at what's going on across these different countries. Um, so as we've been kind of doing this project definition, we are also uh, coming up with these aspects of international collaborations, right? There are a lot of different things that we are uh, balancing to move these projects forward. Um, some of the things that we are, or that I have really learned about through, through this project definition phase uh, is that we all have different priorities. We all have different areas of expertise. So you see Jennifer is a sociologist. I'm an engineer. Um, Matias is an agricultural scientist. So um, kind of finding, uh, point two, finding the intersection of that interest where we can define a project that we're all motivated to work on and can lend some of our skills, maybe not in our specific area of expertise, but something that we feel um, we can add to, right? So that's kind of a challenge when we have uh, countries with different issues or, or just our areas of expertise. Um, another thing that is with any group project, balancing schedules, uh, time zones for us. Now we've entered daylight savings time. Our schedules, our time zones are a little bit closer, which has been great. Um, but really finding the time to meet and talk about what we're going to do moving forward and, and what our project is going to be, um, that can be a challenge for sure. Um, communication, of course, is a huge piece. Not only the avenues in which we are communicating, but so, you know, email to WhatsApp to uh, these Zoom calls have been great because we can't do face to face. Um, but also the language in which we speak, right? So we have Spanish speakers, we have English speakers, we have uh, various levels of fluency. Um, so making sure that nothing is lost in translation as we're collaborating on this project is really important. So I wanted to bring it back to that um, kind of piece that I mentioned earlier, which is scientific collaboration for science diplomacy. I've been really feeling that just through 
doing this project, going through the motions of it, it's all in the process. This is something that Marga has said to us several times, and I should have put it in quotes because I, I attribute it to her. <laughs> it's, uh, it's all in the process, right? We're going through trying to tackle some issue and we have to balance all of these different things. And that really is what science diplomacy is. So um, I just wanted to leave you with that idea. It's all in the process. Thank you. Wonderful, Christina. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you and everybody for these amazing presentations. You make us so proud, I have to say. Um, so I, on purpose, did not share a lot about the science diplomacy program because I wanted you all to explain it and you've done it wonderfully. Um, and, and so some of these uh, lessons we can already extract about, you know, the, exper the importance of experiential learning opportunities. So when we talk about science advice or science into policy, we have realized and through the STBF program as of course the pioneer, but many others that have come after that information doesn't make it from academia, from the lab, from the scientific paper into the policy space. If there are no translators, people who are at the boundary and this concept of boundary spanning has come up in many sessions already in the conference, right? So the people are the vehicles to convey that information in a way that's useful for the policymakers. If you just drop reports and, and, and articles on, you know, on desks for the decision makers to look at, it's never gonna happen. So this is why this, is, uh, this, this program is so important because you are all immersed in each of your policy, you know, government or, or, or private sector spaces. And at the same time, you are now collaborating with each other. And, and another, I think, important skill that really, I think, uh, shines through your um, uh, presentations is that not always you're going, you, you're not always going to know the subject matter of the issue at hand. So when you know, we've talked about this in the conference as well, repeatedly. So when you go from a specialist to a generalist, you have to be comfortable with not knowing every single detail and not having that depth of expertise on that subject, but maybe you bring the skills of a translator, maybe you bring the skills of a communicator, maybe you are you know, a good negotiator, a good spokesperson, a good project manager, all of that is as valuable as a subject matter expertise. So one thing the fellows have had to deal with and sometimes struggle with is this idea of, you know, who's the subject matter expert in the group, who is the expert in this country, who is the expert in uh, managing us all and bringing us to a kind of a consensus. And all of that are the soft skills that we call soft skills that are not soft, they are very important, as important or more than the knowledge and the hard skills. So this is a way experiential learning allows us to train in science diplomacy. But my message here before we, we turn back to them for the questions, is that we need more governments and more countries to really embrace this type of programs. So we've talked about this yesterday, I think. Uh, there are very few countries outside of the global north that have this type of fellowships. The IAI is pioneering that. ASEAN has also a regional program, thanks to another collaboration with uh, STPF and USAID. Uh, but most countries around the world still don't have those. So the message is, if you would like to have this kind of program, please, uh, get in touch with us, with STPF. Everybody wants to help to really bring these programs because that's how you learn. That's how you experience this world. No matter how many courses and workshops and conferences you attend until you are in the shoes and you have the experience, you don't have the transformational um, experience. So with that, um, let's go to the questions. One question to start is about uh, the STEP uh, itself, the program. So Susanna, why don't you tell us who can join, what countries, like, is it open for more member states? Just give us a little bit of uh, info on, on, on STEP in general, because there, there's a few questions on that. Sure, yes, thank, thank you for those questions and thank you for your interest. So we are still in our pilot phase. So we started with Argentina and Mexico City out of some opportune uh, collaborations that came about our partnerships with, uh, with our focal points in those two countries. Um, to be a STEP fellow, you have to be from one of our 19 party countries. I saw that Marga had put a link in the question and answer of what those countries are. So I'm not going to list them all, but you can go to the website. But that's because we work for our, our 19 parties. 
that's where our fellowship programs will be based, but it all depends upon what host countries are interested in fellows and that's subject to the availability of funding and shifting priorities and everything sort of changed as you can imagine over this last year with the pandemic. So. Um, like I said, we're in the pilot phase now and we're actively talking to a lot of our focal points. In fact, the STEP program has been by far the, the newest initiative that's garnered the most interest from our focal points in a long time. So I don't want to state any um, any of the focal points that have, that have expressed interest now because we don't have anything for sure lined up. But I would just recommend that you all stay tuned. Check out the website, iai.int slash STEP. IAI.INT slash step. My colleague Lucia also shared with you all an email where you can directly send us your questions or your thoughts. But when we do have those um, host partnerships lined up, then we do the placement and it'll depend on the host what they're, what they're looking for in terms of the fellowship, fellow profile, um, expertise and so on, but really an idea is also to repatriate some some scientists that have been uh, that have studied or gained their experience abroad or education abroad. Um, and there was one other thing I wanted to share that's now escaped. Um, I guess just to please check our website uh, as it's unfolding and we hope to, to know for sure where our next, oh, I remember what I was gonna say. <laughs> I, keep checking our website. Um, we hope to know where our next cohort can start. We kind of had them starting at different at different timelines. So it makes it a little bit tricky to manage. And also, you know, with the, the pandemic and having to do everything virtually, it sort of shifted our plan. But the fellowships are generally gonna be one to two years long. Again, it depends on the, the host institution, but a minimum of a year. Um, really to enable that that sort of um, exchange. We also have other opportunities, internship programs as well, but I, that's enough about I. I really would rather get some questions to our fellows to hear about their experience, but please do email us if you have questions about STEP or IAI in general and check out the website as well. We'll make sure that those links are in the chat and we'll reshare them as well. Thank you, Susanna. I, I will say that I, I vouch for that. So the IAI has really put um, the most amazing training programs for many years now, transdisciplinary, uh, cross uh, national. So check out all of the offerings, not just step. But let's go back to our fellows. Let's go with Arturo, who had a question about uh, the challenges. And I think Christina and, and, and some of you already touched upon kind of, you know, because in the plenary before, we heard about vaccine diplomacy and about the, you know, the great challenge of COVID and climate change and countries not coming together and not aligning all of these different interests and, and expertise and, and all of that. And what you're doing here is like a microcosms of that, right? Kind of big policy diplomacy with, with capital letters. So already Christina extracted some of those lessons, but what are the challenges of international collaboration in the policy and diplomacy space that you've found so far through uh, this uh, fellowship? And I'll let anyone answer. Uh, thanks for the question. I can briefly start. Um, I would just say um, in terms of you know, a challenge with international collaboration, focusing on a specific issue, whatever that may be, you know, depending on the groups, whether it's, you know, wastewater um, or um, the circular economy, et cetera. Um, our, each fellow might have its own worldview, his or her, their own worldview based on their own experiences, the country they're from, right? And how they look at, say, for, in our case, um, challenges in the Arctic or in the polar regions what that person might think a challenge is greatly will depend on where they're coming from and, and what their worldview might be. Say uh, a fellow from the US might have a, a radically different view of you know Arctic security than a fellow from Mexico, right? Or a fellow from Canada who, you know, whose country is literally encompassing much of the Arctic versus the, the Argentine fellow who has more of an experience with the Antarctic. So I, I think that's one way, uh, you know, trying to come together to find common ground, depending on that worldview is a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. So that's that's the, a good part of it. Great, thanks, Julian. Anyone else wants to share? challenges yeah, so i can jump in here as well so i also agree with julianne to find the common ground is is really challenging 
Uh, at the same time, we know like all of our countries has different priorities. Um, so I'm not saying like, uh, so for example, like for climate change and clean energy. So this is very important, but not every country is working uh, at the same level. So I think this is also important to know the priority and find out this opportunity where we can actually collaborate. So, uh, and like Julian mentioned, this is also an opportunity for us uh, to bring something uh, meaningful, uh, impactful. I think this is one of the best part of this program uh, to collaborate and, and uh, work towards some impactful, uh, meaningful you know, project that can actually bring some impact. Thank you, Asif. Anybody else? Yes, me. Daniel, go ahead. Yes, well, I would say not only the common ground to find the common ground. So uh, a challenge that we face when trying to narrow our topic, so to speak, it was that none of us was expert in the things that we are we were thinking about. So we were trying to, to know what was the best uh, approach, what was the best questions and whatever. Fortunately, we had uh, one member um, who has a lot of knowledge in that area. So that was some kind of guide for us. But uh, other than that, I think that that was our, our most challenging uh, uh, question. I don't know, maybe because we, we were thinking about, well, how can we better find this? Is this an important question or, or not? Or, so that, that was very interesting. And, and also we had uh, the advice from you, Marga. So that was very helpful. But, but I think that was also challenging and interesting, I should say, because uh, uh, I, I would say that somehow that uh, took us to try to put in the position of, of some people who have some knowledge and, and try to, to make a, a very important question or at least an interesting question that could solve, but also could help in, with the science diplomacy uh, interest that, that could align all those uh, positions. So I would say that that was also some uh, important challenge for us. Thank you, Daniel. Um, Sebastian or Cristina, do you want to add something? We have another question, but I'll let you respond if you want. Uh, I would ask Cristina if she's interested in replying. So <laughs> if not, I'll go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, well, everything has been said already by my colleagues. I think that's qu quite a tremendous challenge overall. But for me, in particular, the greatest challenge was as everybody else in this world, the pandemic. Uh, some of the issues that, I mean, science diplomacy, and I think I understand the goal of it, but it was harder to interact or at least incorporate the terms and, and the, the knowledge and the objectives as everything was done virtually and some questions were, were difficult to answer. I'm pretty sure this is a general issue for everybody else, but simultaneously at the same time, and that's, that's the same thing, um, <laughs> sharing the group with other professionals that makes things easier. And uh, one of the greatest things that I've experienced so far is the collaboration with the colleagues, not only from Argentina, but also this group from uh, the, the Aline and Zach in particular, the different point of views um, of similar topics and problematics make an, a really enriching conversation on the topic. So I'll really take that uh, as a whole message. Wonderful, thank you, Sebastian. We have a question from Twitter. Uh, for Julian, why anyone in a tropical Caribbean nation care about the Arctic or Antarctica? Uh, we, we came across <laughs> this question ourselves in our group, especially, um, you know, having a fellow in our group from Mexico, from the Caribbean, um, more or less. And, you know, the one of the first answers, and I think the most obvious one would be 
because of the externalities of climate change, which will likely drastically affect um, you know, ocean faring nations and middle income and developing nations, especially um, tourist facing ones like the Caribbean or ones or agricultural economies more than perhaps um, arguably the nations that are, you know, circumpolar, if you will. So I think that was sort of the, the major uh, first point. And, uh, and the second one is, is also about just, you know, working on um, getting to a global sort of good um, in terms of making sure we respect the polar regions for all the various reasons around climate change, et cetera. Um, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. A very good question. <laughs> Yes, um, and actually we had a, one of the modules, we had someone from Panama, that, so we don't have anyone from Panama in the session, but we had a case study on the science diplomacy strategy of Panama. And this played out very well, the kind of the, the, the tension or the balance between national and global interests. And so we saw very clearly, for instance, for a country like Panama that has a canal that, you know, it's the, the main um, source of, um, of, you know, the main pillar of the economy. Uh, if the Arctic melts and the kind of the northern route, um, shipping route is open, that means less business for the Panama Canal. So then, you know, they are directly impacted, even if they're far away uh, by climate change in a way that perhaps governments in like tropical nations or, um, you know, in South America that are not in the South, like next to Antarctica, perhaps don't have it in their radar. And there's been some attempts, uh, I think from Costa Rica to join the Antarctic Treaty, for instance. And, and we've seen like how challenging it is to convince the governments that this is an important issue when it's so far away and it just doesn't feel that it's an immediate priority. So this is, I really look forward to that, um, to that result uh, from your team, Julian. Um, I'm not seeing any other question. Oh, there's one more. So Sanjana, Sanjana, hi. Um, after you complete your fellowship, where do you expect to go from here? Which organizations in the world of science diplomacy or not? Uh, do you see as a good fit for your next steps? Anyone who wants to dare to guess the future? <laughs> well, um, I have my future ball here, right here, and just draw some dice. <laughs> no, that's a great uncertainty that I guess uh, many colleagues may have, and in particular countries in Latin America, which are experiencing it very tough um, economic downturn of all this pandemic and previous policies and current things. So it's a huge uncertainty, I guess, and many colleagues in particular, um, I can talk about willingness of places to work and that will be much easier. But uh, I think the topics that we selected on our projects, I hope that for all the colleagues, it happens same situation as myself, that they're linked with uh, future interest or int look actual interest of, or future work. So I will be happy to be linked with any institution and or academic and or private organization, NGOs or whatsoever that seeks to narrow the gap between policy design and actual evidence, uh, scientific evidence in practice, hopefully linked with uh, agriculture, water and everything with it. Thanks. <laughs> Um, I'll just add that for me, this whole kind of policy uh, step that I've taken at these fellowships, both AAAS and STEP, is kind of testing the waters, trying to figure out, is this kind of the arena that I want to be in? Is international um, work or science diplomacy uh, what I want to, to be doing long term? So I wouldn't say that I have a particular uh, position that I'm thinking about is going to be my dream job after this. And that's what makes the fellowship opportunity so great for me is that I can do this, uh, test it out, figure out if I'm good at it, figure out if I enjoy this type of work, collaborating internationally, trying to tackle really complex issues. Um, if doing that is going to be fulfilling to me and um, if I can actually make an impact, I think, you know, throughout the fellowship, hopefully I'll figure that out and, and figure out what the next steps will be after that. Anyone else wants to guess their future? Yeah, me. Well, 
I, 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 I guess in the future is very hard. Uh, well, I, I think uh, Christina nailed it very, very good. So I, I'm not uh, trying to guess the future, but, but I will say that uh, I would say that this kind of programs is, a, is an excellent to, to move out from academia, try to test the waters in a different place, so to speak. Because, uh, for example, me, my field, which is physics, uh, usually the, the usual uh, way to go is, uh, well, you end up, then you go to a postdoc and do a lot of papers and try to, to, to keep doing some research and so on until you hit some maybe academia position or the like. But uh, sometimes it's hard because you need some connections, you need to have some established name in the research field, so to speak. But I think that uh, when you try to broad your vision, uh, sometimes you don't see some other uh, ways, some other roads that can be taken. So, I, well, for sure, I don't know what is going to happen, but I'm very, very glad to know all these uh, uh, opportunities that we have. And well, we'll see what, what comes next. Great, thanks. This is very, I mean, it's a tricky question in a, in, a, in, a, in a year like this and in a time like this, right? If it's already hard to answer in regular times, uh, it, it, it's not, it's definitely not easier now. Uh, we have one anonymous question um, and it's about the advantages of working in science diplomacy as compared to working in academia. And before you answer, I would qualify that because those are not mutually exclusive. And I think we've touched upon this several times in several sessions this week, uh, that there are no, it's, it's not an either or, you can work in academia and contribute to science diplomacy. But of course you can also step out and I keep using step, no pun intended, but you can step out of academia and experience this policy world like our fellows are doing. And as Christina said, maybe they want to stay in this world, maybe they decide that that's not for them. They want to go, go back to, to an academic career. So what would you answer? Anyone that already kind of feels the difference or the, you know, if you're more comfortable in one world or the other, or you see yourself more in, more in one world or the other? I can jump in here, Marga. So, uh, so I've been here like in this science diplomacy and policy world for, uh, six to seven months, I believe. So I'm, I, I prefer to, uh, you know, present myself as a, as a scientist or researcher. Uh, so coming from that background and working in policy diplomacy field, it's, it's uh, something, it's very different. Uh, like you mentioned, like we can still work, uh, you know, like in this intersection where we have uh, science and policy work together. So um, having that background in science, I think this is really helpful. Uh, to, uh, you know, like, uh, to understand, let's say, those uh, emerging technologies and their impact. We can, we can bring that to the table, like, uh, immediately. However, uh, the difference that I can see in, this, in these two, uh, you know, different, um, you know, field is, like, in academia, when I was doing my research, I'm really, really uh, focused in, let's say, um, in particular, uh, you know, like details. So, and I spend like so much time figuring out like, you know, like those, those minute details, uh, which is exciting, which is important uh, for the uh, sake of the research. However, in policy and science diplomacy world, we have to think, uh, you know, like uh, we have to have this bird eye view. We have to, uh, you know, understand everything in a very high level. And then uh, this is really broad. It's not as granular as uh, what we see in, in research. So that's a difference. I'm not sure whether that's an advantage, but knowing that difference exists is something you have to admit before you, uh, you know, work in, uh, you know, science diplomacy or policy world from academia. So that, that would be my short answer here. Thank you, Asif. We have two minutes left. So before I pass it back to Susanna for the closing, any other final words? If not, over to you, Susanna. Please everyone help us uh, follow the IEI STEP uh, website, Twitter and 
keep updated uh, on the progress and the outcomes of the projects. And we'll see you soon. Thank you so much, Marga, um, my fantastic co-moderator. And thank you so much, Daniel, Sebastian, Julian, Asif, and Christina. It's been fantastic to hear more about your backgrounds and to see how you're progressing in the projects and especially, you know, the process, how it's how it's like getting together and working across your different disciplines, across borders, across languages, and all these tools that you're developing, no matter where you're taking your career, whether it's back to academia or some other organization, institution, globally or locally, wherever. Um, and also remember this network that you're building. This is where we get to share opportunities with one another, collaborate, maybe new job opportunities. Maybe you have a new peer that you can ask advice. How do I tackle this or handle that? And so I just think the power of the network cannot be overstated. And it's just been wonderful to work with you all. And thank you all so much for attending and joining us at this session um, during the S4D4C final networking conference. So thank you all so much for your questions. And uh, yes, please check the IAI website if you want any more information. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.